So my, my specialty area is behaviour, a little bit of stress physiology, and mostly with sows I've worked with, both in um, gestation and also farrowing systems. So social behaviour and maternal behaviour are really my two major areas of interest. And indeed what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, the ethology of sow aggression. Um, obviously very important topic right now. Um, and important all the time to me because I'm really interested in it. So what, a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about is uh, going to give you a little bit of introduction to social behavior. Um, we're going to talk about the natural behavior of pigs. Um, because it's very important, I think, to compare and contrast the natural behavior of the pig with how they, they have to behave, if you like, within a farm situation. We'll talk about why and when aggression occurs. Um, I'm going to look and give you more de detail about sow aggression. This is an area that I've been working in a lot um, recently, um, looking at the minute detail, quite minute detail that goes on when sows interact in an aggressive way. Uh, we'll talk a bit about management factors influencing aggression and hopefully we'll leave you with some sort of take home message. <clears throat> so in terms of social, we are social beings, we are social animals. So being social is obviously good, right? Um, yep, there are certainly advantages from an animal perspective in a natural environment. It, it can reduce predation. Um, it can improve successful foraging. It can improve the rearing um, of offspring. It can increase choice of mating. And it can help with the things like thermoregulation. So it certainly has advantages, but it's not all one way. So there are certain disadvantages as well. Um, it can increase conspicuousness. It can increase, say, the risk of infection, infectious diseases, um, if animals are living closely together. It can also, of course, decrease access to resources, especially for those animals that are low in the social hierarchy. And so this is really what we come to, the nub of the problem for us in terms of sow housing is competition. So we might define social behavior as those patterns of behavior that involve two or more members of a species. And we can think about nice positive social behaviors. But of course we can also use the same definition when we think about the less positive or the negative aspects of social behavior. Uh, and that is what we're going to talk about. We house pigs in groups. Uh, we can get this, these kind of pictures from, from the animals that we house in groups. So like I said, to start with, I really want to take you back and think a bit about natural behavior. So to better understand how to manage pigs' behavior in our current systems, we really need to take a step back. And of course, we're lucky in that we can do that, because there we have the wild ancestor of our domestic pig, and we can study that wild ancestor and get a good understanding of how wild boar behave in nature. And what we find is that when we think about the social group for wild boar, um, it's really very small. We're talking about two to four adult females and their related females, mother offspring or sisters. Associated with them would be unweaned juveniles um, from this year's litter or litters. And also, of course, sub-adults might be there as well from previous litters. Uh, as the sub-adults reach adulthood, they will break off and form their own social group. The boars aren't associated with these core groups all the time. They only really associate with the females around breeding season. The group size will vary um, according to the season and to the available resources. The groups themselves will distribute geographically around resources, and then the boars distribute around the groups. Now within that social group, the sows are very definitely dominant to all those other younger members of the group. And in fact, overt aggression within core groups of wild boar is very rare. Dominant sows will displace subordinate sows, not with the need of physical aggress aggressive interactions, but just sort of kind of threat avoidance type interactions, um, you know, especially for things from, like uh, choice feeding places, things like that. The litters, when they're born, you know, the sow will disassociate, disassociate herself from the group to go and have her litter, and gradually she will introduce those piglets into the group, and the other sow members will be doing the same thing. So litters are great, uh, great, gradually introduced into the group. 
Um, and the home ranges of these groups can overlap, so they're not strictly territorial. They won't defend territory. They'll have overlapping home ranges. Um, but groups that share ranges will not interact. So again, avoidance is really the key. But we might ask ourselves, well, you know, you know, look at those, you know, wild boar, domestic pig, surely not the same animal. Well, again, we have studies out that have been done out there. We have science to back it up that really does show us that domestic pigs will behave quite like wild boar, given the opportunity. So if you put domestic pigs into a natural enclosure, semi-natural enclosure, uh, you will find that social behavior very much reverts back to what we see with wild boar. They form their family groups. Again, small core groups of related females and progeny. Solitary males associate with the groups at mating. Groups may share common space in home ranges, but don't merge, don't interact. Groups maintain distance, both from, e from each other when foraging within the same group. Because when foraging, it's been shown that maybe the average distance between group members is around about four meters, so they spread out and forage. Um, and of course, that distance you know, prevents any type of aggressive interaction happening over, over food. But that's a distance that is quite big when we think about it in commercial terms. Within these core groups, again, aggression is very rare. Uh, maybe only once every two hours per animal. So um, strategy, again, is very much one of avoidance. And then if we take it a step further and start thinking about, well, what happens then if we compare the natural situation, if you like, in inverted commas, with the farm situation? natural situation, we're talking about small groups. We're talking about stable social structure. We're talking about related animals. Within that group, with all the youngsters as well, we've got a very wide age size profile. They're living in a fairly unlimited space. They have a complex environment, and they have a complex behavioral repertoire. They're spending an awful lot of time active and foraging during day daytime, at least, uh, especially during dawn and dusk is when they have peaks of activity. And when we think about the farm situation, where maybe we have, you know, in the case of sows in crates, singly housed to very large groups, we might have a very unstable social structure. Uh, we might, if we have a dynamic kind of system where we've got sows, especially being moved in and out, relatedness will be variable. Usually we keep our pigs in a very narrow age and size profile. Of course, they're living in restricted space. They're living in a, a much less complex environment and their behavioral repertoire is constrained. And we find in the types of systems that we house them, they're spending an awful lot of time inactive. So it's really very different. So not surprisingly, when you put um, say our social behavior into the context of what we have in our farm situation relative to our, un and to our natural situation, not surprisingly, we get issues. <clears throat> So when and why does aggression occur, the two major things when we're talking about aggression for sows and we're talking about group housing, the major times that we're going to find aggression happening is around the time of group formation, when we're mixing animals. And, and then feeding time is the other time within their normal um, daily routine where we might see aggression happening in particular. With mixing, we're thinking, we're talking about this, this formation of social hierarchy. So when you mix pigs, invariably you get aggression. You're never going to be able to mix pigs and not have aggression as they establish that social hierarchy. You're going to get quite high levels of aggression very soon after you mix them. Hopefully, all being well, that aggression quickly dissipates and disappears and reaches a very steady, very low baseline level if the management of the system is good. The other time is feeding, where obviously they are competing for, potentially, depending on the feeding system that you have, access to um, a scarce resource for them. And of course, at this time, we can also see reinforcement of the social hierarchy. So other factors impacting aggression. I've got up here housing, groups versus stalls. Um, I don't like the idea of you know, calling every group just a group. You know, within group housing systems, we obviously have a wide range of choices, different types of system. Um, but a lot of the arguments that you see, it's all about groups versus stalls. It's much more complex than that. It's not easy just to say groups versus stalls. We think about mixing. How many times are we mixing? Is it going to be a stable group? Is it going to be a dynamic group? How many pigs are we mixing in at a time? These are all factors that might impact the amount of aggression that we see. 
course, feeding is going to be something that is big, the method of feeding especially, um, the quantity of food that we give them, maybe some of the ingredients within that food, food can have an, an impact on aggression. And then of space is the other big one as well, the amount of space and the quality of space, um, things to bear in mind. In terms of what I'm going to be able to cover today, uh, primarily I'm going to focus on some of this aspect, mixing. Um, but we're going to touch on some of this. I really haven't got time. It's a whole other lecture to talk about feeding systems for sows, um, and I haven't got time to cover that in, in enough detail that it deserves, I think. So I'm going to focus mostly on the ones that I've got circled. <clears throat> so you might ask the question, well, okay, so we've got aggression in the system. What is the impact on the pig? Um, there is potentially quite a big impact on the pig. I mean, we all know about this magic word called stress, the you know, most of us tend to suffer from, to some degree, from uh, various times of our day um, in our life. We think about it on a physiological level. We're talking about activation of both these stress axes, both the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis and the, and the HPA, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. We're seeing increases in stress hormones. We're seeing increases, physiologically increases in heart rate, blood pressure, things like that. We can have an impact on health. Um, not just from the outside in terms of skin lesions, maybe leg injuries where they're trying to avoid each other and hurting themselves on parts of the pen. We can also see a depression of immunity, which obviously opens them up to um, infection and other disease. And of course, in terms of the bottom, the bottom line, um, you know, it can have an impact on productivity. Depending on the feeding system, we can see either de you know, depressed or very variable feed intake, uh, impacts on growth, impacts on body condition, depending when we mix them, impacts on pregnancy rate, um, and potentially impacts on litter size. So it can very definitely have an impact for the producer. Like I say, to begin with, we're going to focus a little bit on mixing. If we're having a group housing system, there are various times that we could mix our pigs. Um, the theory of what I'm going to talk about now is really, really pertains to, to all of these. And what I'm going to focus on initially is what happens when we mix pigs? Okay, on a gross level, you stand back and you watch pigs. They tend to fight. What I've been doing is looking at it at a much more detailed level. And if you think about it as social beings ourselves, you know, when you meet somebody for the first time, um, you, know, you, t you tend to be both giving out social cues but also reading the social cues of the other person as well in the way that you interact. You know, be it handshake, voice, eye contact, all those kind of things. So you're carrying out a behavior, they're responding, carrying out behavior. This is what I've been doing with the pigs. So I've been breaking down these social interactions into very minute parts. And when you think about it, you can, you can really break it down. So pig one carries out some sort of behavior. Maybe pig one initially will follow a pig or approach a pig. Pig two then maybe does something. Maybe it turns and goes nose to nose. Then pig one goes nose to nose as well. And then maybe pig two doesn't respond. So this way, you, you look at every interaction, you can build this chain of reciprocal behaviors, if you like. Pig one does this, pig two does that, pig one does this, pig two does that. It can be a very short string and the interaction finishes. It can be a very, very long string. And then what we can do is mathematically, we can tease it apart to see if we can distinguish what we would call meaningful pairs of behaviors from just randomly occurring pairs. And the next slide is the scary one because this is the kind of picture that we tend to build up. We can build up pictures and things and then look at the relationships and to decide well, what's important and what's not important. What can we just throw out as random noise, but what is really distinctly telling us something? And this is really what, what this is talking about. Um, and I'm certainly not going to go into the detail of that, but just trust me when I say that, you know, the science in this, and you can, you can pull apart these social interactions and get an idea of what's important and what's not so important. What we've done is um, we've investigated four different scenarios, if you like. We've looked at mixing just pairs of unacquainted pigs or mixing a subgroup of three, which is already stable, and another subgroup of three, so six pigs together. And we've looked at doing this both indoors, um, still in relatively, whoops, go back, relatively large amount of space. We're still talking about 32, 34 square feet per animal. Or of course on the extreme, we're mixing outdoors in, 
you know, I mean, it's still a paddock, so there's some limits to it, but we'd call it a kind of limitless space. And then looking for similarities and differences in their approach to that mixing encounter to see, you know, what sparks aggression, what doesn't spark aggression. What we find is that in all the 47 different mixing scenarios that we looked at, we got social interaction between those unacquainted animals. In 45 of the 47, we got aggressive interactions. Two of the outdoor pairs did not engage in aggression. There is more aggressive actions in indoor groups, but then of course you have more pigs as well. But when you compare that indoor group with the outdoor group, you see a lot less in terms of aggressive actions outdoors um, compared to indoors. And in fact, we get a difference between our pairs as well. This was the one that was really quite interesting to me. is so that when you're doing this sequential analysis, you're looking at the behavioral components, how many behaviors happen before you get what we would call that first really aggressive action, that first push, or that first head knock, or that first bite. And here what we find is that this indoor pair really stands out from the other situations. What we find with the indoor pair is that it's much more cagey, if you like. In terms of that interaction, there's a lot more testing of each other that goes on before you know, that real fight breaks out. But only in that indoor pair. So indoor, okay, maybe they carry out 20 behaviors before, before their first kind of body push. Well then they've actually carried out 65, 70 behaviors before their first knock. Maybe 85, 90 behaviors before their first bite. So there's this steady kind of ramping up of intensity in aggression. But only when there's two sows mixed indoors. In all other situations, um, the outdoor pairs, the outdoor groups, the indoor groups, you actually find that they're in some ways doing the opposite. They're very, very quick to engage in that high intensity bite. Let's get into it and sort, of sort it out and get it over with. And the, I mean, it's very interesting for me. And I think the idea is that, well, outdoors, of course, you've got all that space that you can utilize. So if you engage and you lose, you can hightail it out of town and disappear, and then avoid. You've maybe sorted it out very quickly, but you can avoid. Similarly, indoors in the group, it's almost like you can lose yourself in the crowd, I think. So even though you get engaged very quickly, if you lose, well, it's not that one-on-one -on -one situation. It's like, okay, well, there's five other pigs. If I kind of hide myself over there in the corner, then, okay, you know, I can hide in that crowd. And I think there's an element of that. Indoors, when there's only two pigs, it's such an important um, situation. You know, if I win this, I'm the boss. If I lose it, I'm the loser, and I can't avoid it. But there's a lot more testing that goes on to determine whether, do I really have a chance to win this or not before I launch into that attack and launch into that aggressive interaction. So it's very interesting. When you think about the groups in a bit more detail, obviously when we've got a subgroup of three and a subgroup of three, we've got all these different pairs of animals, potentially. Um, we've actually got nine possible unacquainted pairs, and we've got six acquainted pairs, those are the subgroup members. Again, what we find, we, we're quite different both indoors and outdoors. So indoor is the blue, outdoor, uh, indoor is the green, outdoor is the blue. We find, okay, we've got 15 possible pairs. Well, nearly all of those pairs interact socially when you mix them indoors. Um, quite a lot of them interact non-aggressively. We're about half of them interacting aggressively. And then what we would call really reciprocally fighting, we've got, well, maybe only about four or five pairs out of our nine. Um, out of our nine unacquainted pairs that are really fighting. We actually do see that some fighting breaks out within our acquainted pairs as well when we, when we mix indoors. So even though we've got 15, uh, we've got nine possible unacquainted pairs, they don't all have to fight for this social order to be established. And outdoors, indeed, it's much, much less. So we're, only, we're relying on only about one or two of these pairs fighting, and then the whole thing dissipates, and social order is almost... Is, is gained from maybe just, you know, we haven't really looked at this in enough detail, but maybe it's the, if the boss pig from one of these subgroups 
versus the boss pig of the other subgroup. Well, the, other, the others within the subgroups, they're kind of good to let the leaders decide who's going to be the boss and who isn't. And they can get it over and done with, and then they can avoid. So by no means do we need all these pigs to, to fight each other for social order to be established. So we know that space is especially affecting how these sows behave at mixing. When space is limitless, we do see that this strategy quickly involves avoidance. Certainly they do in these paddocks. You know, once the interaction has happened and they've got some idea of social order, that subgroup of three and that subgroup of three, they'll just skirt around each other and avoid each other. They can do that when the space is limitless. When space is limited, it's different. Avoidance is difficult, and the same behavior can in fact have very different results. So this table, just to, um, so what I mean by break, break is the interaction finishing. Okay, so the interaction ends with break. Preceded by withdraw, so that means one pig is basically running away, it's followed by break, the interaction finishes. Outdoors, that works really, really well. So in the, the outdoor pair and the outdoor group, um, if you withdraw nearly half the time, that's going to put an end to that social interaction. So you retreat, interaction finishes. Indoors, it just doesn't, doesn't happen like anywhere near that amount because you can't truly get away. Break preceded by no response. So quite often you'll see one pig is interacting with a pig and the other pig is just, nope, not going to respond, not going to respond. Fairly similar across the, the environments, that often that works as well to break the situation. But then what we see is quite different. Sometimes that no response, if you're not responding, outdoors, mm, well maybe pig number one is still going to come and bite you, but only maybe 18% eight, of the time. Indoors, there's a much higher likelihood of no response, of just trying to ignore the situation, almost like you know the ostrich putting the head in the sand, go away. Indoors, it can be followed by a bite quite a lot, and, and more, more than randomly possible anyway. It's, it's quite an important one. Now, these ones actually work to do the opposite. So if you think about this nose-to-nose -nose contact or anogenital nosing, these really, these are all lower than we, you would expect um, by random choice. So these are, these are all significantly lower here. So they will not be followed very much by biting, knocking, pushing. So any of these really overt behaviors, nose to nose, anogenital nosing, getting information off each other is a really good thing. And that works to depress aggression. So there's been quite a lot of methods tried, if you like, to um, decrease the aggression at mixing, and I'm not going to go through all these details. We've written a review in Pig News and Information, dated well, back in back in 2005, which lists a lot of these things. Some of these things work, some of them don't work. Some have really mixed results. We think about, you know, these involve elements of housing design, um, elements of feed, elements of super dominance. This idea of subgroups and space and, and pre-exposure. I'm going to concentrate on these last two a little bit more. Um, Work done with space, work by Sandra Edwards in the UK, um, looking at the design especially of a mixing pen. Does that have an effect on aggression? We find that if you give them less space, ooh, look, maybe it, it reduces aggression. Problem is though, when you look at damage scores, you find that damage scores are actually higher in the less space. So you might get fewer aggressive interactions, but you tend to get higher intensity interactions. So in fact, there's little evidence for optimum space allowance to reduce aggression when you're mixing pigs. Again, another study um, by Barnett down in Australia. Aggression may be reduced at high density, um, but again, only initially. You know, a lot of the experiments that are done on mixing, you know, you need to take the longer term picture. If you just come in and think, oh, let's just focus on the hour after we've mixed them, you take your data, go away and, and look at the results. Well, you get different results depending on how long you've watched the pigs for. So the number of interactions may be a bit fewer early on in low space, but over time you might find that actually it reverses and goes the other way. Um, and there's, there's not actually that many really good design studies out there that look at long-term implications of some of these mixing strategies. Uh, other, other work done by Weng et al. here in 98, again finding this is um, density in meters per square, uh, meters, yeah, square meters per sow. 
again we find that in fact the lower the, the square meters per cell uh, more aggressive interactions and more lesion scores so space is, is certainly an element that comes into aggression another thing that um, that we've talked about in the past and this is work done back in Cambridge when I was a PhD student a long time ago uh, looking at pre-exposure and there we had a, an electronic sow system which was a dynamic system and enabled us to actually we well, could close gates across here and almost form a pen within the pen like that so there's the pen within the pen and you do that introduce the animals that are being introduced would go in here for a few days and then you'd open the gates and let them in uh, and what you do find is that it, it, it does decrease aggression and this was looked at over day of mixing a day, a week, two weeks after, and all the results are the same. So that if you pre-expose the animals prior to mixing, this idea being that maybe they can get some of this important behavior, this nose-to-nose -nose contact, anogenital nosing contact through the bars, but not have to fight, that it did reduce aggression. Um, so the results of that, if you like, and, and the results from our mixing scenarios are saying that this vocal, olfactory, visual, limited physical cues maybe are conveying important information that the sows can pick up from each other and um, get to know each other. Are they conveying familiarity? Are they conveying relative social rank, relative fighting ability? These are terms that we use. And so when we mix, we know that all possible combinations of, uh, not all possible combinations of pigs fight, and yet the hierarchy is established. So I guess what I'm telling you really is that you know we're still learning the science of aggression in sows. There's still more that we need to know. Um, a lot of this is you know it's hidden in the detail, and we need to get to that detail before we can really then move it forward and apply it into the current housing systems or the future housing systems that we're going to use. So pre-exposure. In fact, we've we've done a study as well. Um, which we thought, well, okay, over here, maybe a lot of times, you know, we're not forming the group straight away. We're going to put them into service crates for a while, and then after they've been in the service crates for some time, then we're going to mix our groups. We're going to form our groups. Um, and one of the farms that I was working with, what they would do is, well, at weaning, they just take the sows out and just fill up the crates as the sows come out of the farrowing crates. And then either said they had two different units at seven days or 35 days post-service, then they would think, right, we've got to form our groups of three. It was small groups of three. They'd go down the, the row and kind of, well, we pick that one and that one and that one because they're picking on things like body condition and size. Um, and I said to them, well, what, what about if you can almost do an element of pre-sorting as you wean them out of the, out of the farrowing crates? Can you think about trying to put your three next to each other already into the service crates? And is that going to help? when it comes to then putting them into um, gestation pens a bit later. That was the idea. So pre-select. Pre-select your group out of the farrowing house next to each other or random se randomly separate them. So here we say, right, these three blues are going to form a group. These three greens are going to form a group. The yellows are another group. The oranges are another group. So we've got this difference between those that at least know a little bit about each other and those that don't. And they were housed in service crates, um, both seven and 35 days post-service. We're, we're still working on the behavior of this because, like, like I say, it's one of these things that you enter into and actually taking out all this detail of the behavior is extremely time-consuming and laborious. Um, but you can get an idea of the aggression that goes on in a system by looking at lesion scores. And what we actually found, well, if they're grouped after seven days in service crates, there's really nothing there to show us. When you look at the lesion scores and looking at the preliminary behavior data, again, there's nothing really there to show us of any particular advantage of housing them next to each other. When you go to 35 days, in fact, if anything, you're getting a, dis you're getting a disadvantage. So what we're finding is when we group our sows together, and then put them into for 35 days and then put them into a, a gestation pen together, we're finding an increase in aggression rather than a decrease. Um, and that to me, of course, was, a, was the unexpected result. I expected it to work the other way, but you know, science being what it is, it tells you something different. So that's fine. We go back to the drawing board, make new hypotheses, and, and revisit and come back. And in fact, it's not so. Um, it's not so ridiculous when you think about it, because even though we might think that, well, the answer to aggression is to keep, housing, uh, keep sows in gestation crates, 
we know that, in fact, crate housing is not trouble-free, and that inter-sow aggression of sows in, in gestation crates can really be very high, because you don't get those physical consequences because they're not fighting each other. Um, this is work again done in Cambridge a um, number of years back, and here the animals were kept in similar, in the same types of housing systems for long term. When you looked at aggression in first parity, you found that, well, the agonistic interactions, aggressive interactions started higher in groups. The proportion which escalate was higher in groups compared to um, crates, the green being the crates. Okay, but you're, you're talking about maybe in the large group, 5% of aggressions which would escalate, uh, aggressive interactions would escalate. By the time you came back, fourth parity, things were very, very different. And you looked at aggression there, you'd find no significant difference here between the number of interactions. But then when you look at the proportion of interactions which are escalating, um, much, much higher now between those sows that are housed in gestation crates. You're almost getting up to a quarter of all interactions would escalate. So there is, in fact, a lot of social stress going on being housed next to each, next to somebody that you cannot resolve that aggression with. And so if anything, I think that is the issue we're seeing, where we're housing these sows next to each other for 35 days and getting that kind of pent-up aggression, if you like, of not being able to fix out, fix their, their, their hierarchical issue, if you like, not being able to fight, not being able to come up with some sort of resolution to that conflict. And then when you put them into a pen, hey presto, you get this immediate fighting, you get higher lesion scores, and then things settle out. Five minutes. Okay, well, that's good. I've got last two slides then, really. So I guess my take-home message is that, um, you know, I certainly feel that a thorough understanding of social behavior is um, critically important, critically important when it comes to housing pigs in groups. Okay? Commercial practice often does conflict with natural social behavior. We see the natural social organization of sows. We're trying to squeeze this into the current commercial systems that we have. It's no surprise to me that it makes something that is very, very difficult to manage. So where system design or management is inadequate, aggression can be problematical. There may well be a fairly low impact when you look at the population of that pen or that system as a whole. But you know, it's very, very high impact on some individuals within that. So those animals that are you know, getting beaten a lot it's a very, very high cost for them. Unfortunately, there's still a great many unknowns. Okay, I've already explained to you that I think we still don't even know enough just about the basic ethology that is going on when sows interact with each other. And of course, there's many types of group housing. You know, we see this label of group housing. It means so many different things feeding system, group size, space, stability, flooring, you name it, you know, all these things impact into what we have as a label of group housing. Genetics is something that we really haven't talked about and haven't even got as far as investigating. You know, you talk to any pig farmer, certainly back in the UK, you know, that they would give you their opinion for sure on different lines or breeds of pigs that did well in group systems and others that didn't. Um, and we still, you know, we haven't gone down that road, really, and I think it's an element that we really, really need to be looking at as well. And, of course, when we as researchers do these projects, they're very expensive. We tend to be focusing on individual elements. We're going to do an experiment on space allowance, you know, and that's all we do. That's the only one thing that we vary. And the big problem is, you know, what we really want to know is how on earth do all these components interact. Um, because it's those interactions that will determine whether this system will work or not. Husbandry is an absolute key. You can have the perfect system. You don't have the person to operate that system. It, you know, it, it makes no difference. The system cannot be perfect without the perfect person, without the good husbandry. Husbandry, the art or practice of breeding, and you know, husbandry as a term seems to have sort of gone out of the window, really. You know, we, we used to be animal husbandry. Well, now we're animal science. You know, but husbandry is so important, so important. Um, definitions, dictionary definitions, farming, especially when regarded as a science, but skill or art, you know, we know it is more than science. It is more than science.
signs. A good stock person is just worth their absolute weight in gold. So I would say to you very, very definitely, you have to invest in your people if we're going to move towards group housing systems. And it certainly looks like that is what is going to happen. There's no getting away from it. But the key to all this is less the system design, but much more the people that we have working with the systems that we're going to use. They have to know what to do. So investing in people to get group housing working is absolutely